research. So his topic, his talk is imagining futures for easier and better research work. So Chris, thanks for being with us and uh, please take it away. Just one moment, I had a bit of audio issues on my end. Um, so I only heard you at the very latest. Uh, so uh, caught me a bit off guard. So thanks, Jeroen, at least for the introduction, even though I didn't catch it. Um, All good so, things. I was very friendly about you. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm very happy to, to be here today. And uh, also that this time slot ended up being the final dedicated time slot of the conference. I thought I'd try and uh, do something a bit, uh, a bit different today. Um, so uh, as Jeroen mentioned, uh, I'm going to really be talking about imagining futures in research work. And I, I think that with imagining, there's always some fun stuff that we can do. And I hope to have you leave here with some, some nuggets of Im imagination, uh, ideas for the issues we've heard about the past few days, and also some that we maybe didn't hear as much about. Um, so it'll be a bit of an unconventional session. Uh, I won't necessarily use slides. I won't give a talk per se, but I'm trying out something new and I will tell a short fictional story uh, of a potential future, after which I'd also love to hear your ideas for a future in, in research work. So what are big issues you see? What are some pet peeves that you think need to be fixed? Um, doesn't necessarily need to be integrity. There's a, a lot going on. I know that one of the things that my, I, I posted a blog once about pet peeves of peer review. I think there's a lot to do there as well, which can benefit research um, in, in the long term. But yeah, after three days, I can imagine we're full of ideas. So I'd also like to take the time before the panel discussion even to help us find some next steps for action because that's what, what for me really is the core all the time is uh, how, how do we take the next step. Um, so I used to be an academic myself, but I left academia because I felt like there was, uh, that that was not the right space for me to take those next steps. So I ended up founding my own organization and there we're trying to do a lot of stuff uh, which will also like sneak peek here uh, today. So telling a story, a uh, fictional story like this uh, in front of so many people is something new, which I'm trying out today. So let me kindly know if you think it's fun or not or anything in between, please. I greatly appreciate any feedback. Um, and also as sort of like before I get started, if you're completely zoomed out after these three days, um, Feel free to grab your headphones, go sit in a comfy chair. I don't have any slides, so you don't need to look. You can also go lie on the floor or go for a walk, and get comfortable in any way, because there really is uh, zero need to look at my white face for the duration of all of this. Um, so really try to immerse yourself a bit in the story. I hope it's, it, I, I hope it's some good, um, but I'll start by, uh, by setting the scene a bit. 15 years from today, a Wednesday in August 2036, the academic year is about to start. It's a year the Northern Hemisphere burned in the summer and the Southern Hemisphere burned in the winter. Uh, people had learned to act after the decadent inaction at the start of the millennium, but still, this was the cost. Learning to act meant that nobody had any patience any longer for anything that was superfluous. Academic grandparents recalled the days they spent formatting, submitting, and correcting proofs for journals. Academic grandchildren said, we don't have the time. The time to waste, that is. And even if they did, in 2036, Elsevier, Springer Nature, the big five publishers all went bankrupt in a time span of just four years after the financial meltdown of 2028, over leveraged in a cash poor market that got hit by overdue regulation, the analysts analyzed. For a moment, everybody relied on preprint servers. After the pandemic of 2020, 2021, Preprints had become common knowledge, but this was the point in time they became household knowledge. It showed that the oiled machine of publishing needed much less oil. Researchers faced the reality that in a digital age, they were already publishing experts and were simply being upsold things they didn't need. 
typeset proofs made by underpaid workers required more time to correct than to be typeset by researchers themselves, as they did for preprint servers, all faults remaining their own. Communities even started forming around preprints, reading and providing feedback among researchers, easy as that. We could have done that a decade ago, was the common sentiment. But it took the time that it took, and this change brought confidence to researchers that they could do a lot more than they gave themselves credit for. They even started making demands in publishing. In 2034, a change started bubbling. The newfound confidence gave rise to a culture of realizations potentially overdue. Why is our primary work treated as second class? Some wondered as they wrote data papers for the record instead of putting the data sets themselves on the record. Is this the best we can do? Some rightly wondered as new media had popped up left and right for two decades, but publishing remained digital paper. Preprint servers, archive, sci-archive, and countless, countless more became the established interests after the publishing vacuum of 2032. They weren't prepared to concede the power it had taken them four decades to win, bathing in their self-found legitimacy of having won and that making them the bearer of the future. What had happened was that the power had shifted, but it hadn't changed. Publishing house or not, Preprint servers did a lot of the same work, albeit in a different manner. Digital paper printed on demand. Digital paper read by pinching on phones and tablets. Digital paper about work done a substantial time before. Depending on the writing speed, maybe a few months. Digital paper with recycled text across the various preprints, leading to wasteful pages and distracting elements. Even though text recycling was no longer considered plagiarism after integrity codes of 2025, it was still a nuisance to have to figure out whether they tweaked some parameters in that or the other methods section of a replication, or did a verbatim copy-paste. Out of this newfound dissatisfaction with digital paper, module servers arose. Inspired by work dug up from the archives of Elsevier's research department, module servers were designed to be an elegant way to share a variety of outputs that composed re research projects. Free to read, free to publish, with purely researcher-generated content. These module servers were nothing more than a glorified repository, and yet they remained substantively different for one reason. Instead of relegating developments such as pre-registrations and data sets as add-ons to digital paper, it put them front and center in the record. It made whatever output you created as a researcher the output you would publish. At the start, we started sharing sections of papers as modules, but soon we started filling the gaps we previously couldn't in text videos of lab protocols, 3D models of the hardware we custom designed and 3D printed for our studies, transcripts of interviews, data sets collected, processing pipelines, revisions of writing. On its own, that would not be enough. It would be a mess, modules all over the place without context. But that's how it started, one big heaping mess. One module server had introduced a phone app leading to pub people publishing modules with pictures of birds, mobile uh, pH value uh, measurements, and other field work, some even including stool sample documentation. At least everybody got to author, author their work in their language, regardless of title, status, or type of output, even if difficult to curate still. But these module servers missed context. Papers did all the lifting in one place. They set the stage, reviewed previous work, and held your hand through the new work. Module servers ended up as a hodgepodge of disparate pieces of research, much like the repositories of the early days, 
such as Figshare or Zenodo. It was when one module server introduced connections between the modules that things started falling into place. Not only was the complete record of modules there for everybody to see, the order of events for any given module and its parents as well, breadcrumbs, so to speak. Hodgepodge made way for organization, breadcrumbs helped find the context needed. If there was no breadcrumb at all, it was clear. Take this module with many grains of salt. It has no context. We don't know where it came from. We don't know what it means. But if it was deeply interconnected to previous work by other researchers or themselves, that gave confidence and ways to inspect the provenance. Where exactly do these data come from? Where does this result come from? The connections and lines between them started looking like the maps you see at underground stations. Various lines to be traced back to various destinations, with some stations being hubs in the network. It would get so complicated, people started making actual maps. They printed them out and trawled through them. Some even considered them for their CVs as a snapshot of their work, depicting more than just a number. But there was also an unexpected benefit, deduplication. There was no time to waste, and duplicated words or resources were the worst. A theory needed to be published once, and all the subsequent hypotheses linked to that same theory. No more text recycling, duplicate publishing of the same information if at least nothing changed about it. Replications became incentivized and cost-effective. Breadcrumbs meant that replications made the original methods more heavily connected and that the methods didn't need to be restated, all with proper lines of provenance and contributorship, potentially between people who never even realized they contributed to the same line of research. In the summer of 2036, when the, when the trees burned across the world, the module servers had their pandemic moment. They became well-known, although not household knowledge, when the fires got so out of control in so many places that air quality became a daily factor for moving around, doing menial things like groceries. Citizen science, scientists used their phones to create the largest air quality data set ever constructed. A simple attachment for each phone, 3D printed based on previously validated designs, published on a module server just a few weeks ago, measured air quality every minute, and published each data point. Thousands of people around the world partic participated in this citizen sensing, going outdoors like the peak days of Pokemon Go. Automated data analysis pipelines help pinpoint areas where it would be unsafe to go in a few hours. A meteor meteorological service of air quality all based on research just done a few minutes before. People built on these and many other research modules with whatever value people saw because there was a world to win and no time to waste. And module servers are not a pipe dream. Um, so this is something we're actively building at Liberate Science and will be available in, uh, in February. But um, the idea behind this story also and behind changing up publishing, and I think what, what today is all about, is really that a lot of the research issues, we can try to solve and do a lot of things at universities, or in individual practices. But a big issue there is really that they will always have to go through the bottleneck of publishing. So if we do not expand the record of publishing, if we do not expand how we conceptualize publishing and how research integrity comes into play with this, then it's also gonna be incredibly difficult to make some, some really major steps. Um, 
So it's a bit shorter than the original half hour that I was given uh, the story itself, but I think that's also perfectly okay because I wanted to take a bit of time to also hear from you what your thoughts are within the space of like imagining futures of research work. I saw in the chat before that people from across the world have already been joining and I'm just another white continental European guy and I would love to hear what issues and experiences people are facing across the world, uh, really, because ultimately, I think in the talk just before, we spoke a bit about global inequities, uh, and I think that's something that's really, uh, that we really have to highlight um, as we move forward, because solutions aren't solutions if they just work for a specific group. Um, so I'd be very happy to, to have a bit more of a, of a discussion and hear questions. And I hope that the story, if it wasn't any good, that, you know, that at least you have now 15 minutes more to relax, uh, if, because you can also walk away, so. <laughs> Thanks so much, uh, Chris. <laughs> also for, you know, being mindful of our time here. Um, you know, I thought the story was great. Um, I, I didn't particularly like the part about the burning trees, but I guess, you know, yeah, that's where we're heading. Um, so one thing, um, and, and for, for those in the audience, please do share your thoughts and, and questions in the, uh, the Q&A. Um, so one thing that occurred to me as I was listening to your story was that it reminded me a little bit of sort of early optimistic accounts of, uh, of the internet and sort of journalism on the internet. Uh, can, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Yes, I, oh, I so sometimes just am afraid that something is happening in my surroundings. Okay, good, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> now I was wondering about your, your headphones. But anyway, so in the early days of the internet, so it's sort of early 90s, uh, the previous century, people had these sort of wonderful utopian stories about how the internet was going to democratize and, and equalize everything and everyone could now be a journalist and it, it would all become one global village. And it, it sort of sounded to me like the story you were telling um, sort of replicates that story, except you know it's more limited to science in particular. And sort of given that we've seen what the internet is today, aren't you worried that you might be a little overly optimistic? So I think it need, uh, that's a super fair point. Uh, we've seen a lot of stuff go wrong and rogue uh, with, uh, like, that we're not in 2036 now, but 2021 again, the last uh, five years. And I think the main thing there is really also about having, recognizing that people make mistakes. I think uh, just now um, about the work at Elsevier where simply people also make mistakes with respect to consent. So you need to be able to delete things every now and then. That's a completely reasonable expectation. And at the same time, there's also this point of how do you moderate the content that people, um, that people upload? That is a very fair question. And I think there it's also, there's this, this balance between autonomy, consent, and I think community moderation also comes into play. So there is this question of, well, should everything be open? Probably not. You should have a way to granularly um, manage your permissions and also have ways to make sure that information doesn't get out which shouldn't be getting out. So for example, recently um, with my old colleagues from Tilburg University, we did a study where we checked out open data sets for um, HIPAA or GDPR violating data. So for example, very simple IP addresses. And it does happen that, that these get shared. It's, you know, it's not more than 50%, but it's still too much if it's 5%. So how can we build uh, mechanisms that already at the time of, uh, of upload or before even sharing that scan for some of these things. When I go into my Google Workspace uh, admin, it always tells me, hey, you're sharing X files outside of your organization with, uh, this, with, with gender information. And are you aware you should maybe do something about this? And I think there's ample space to build and create community-based tooling to really help with these kinds of things and, and uh, not centralize that, that power like we've had with, for example, Facebook or Twitter, where people get suspended for 
unknown or opaque reasons and then subsequently maybe even their livelihood depends on it. Um, it happened with um, I think an athlete who put, took a picture of their silver medal at the Olympics and got banned from Instagram for three days because the IOC owns all the copyright on everything regarding the Olympics. <laughs> wow, that's, I didn't hear about that, but that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Um, so is it so? I'm wondering. I'm sort of trying to envision the um, uh, a model for for what you have in mind. So would it be fair to say that? What you're describing here is, is a little bit like Wikipedia, except, I mean, it's sort of more multi-dimensional, sort of it has different uh, media, um, different sorts of media and objects and stuff in it. But so th the reason I'm asking is because Wikipedia is also very much this sort of wisdom of the crowds, community-based collective effort that sort of seems to resemble what you have in mind. So in that sense, with Wikipedia, indeed, like uh, many people edit the same page, this uh, this would definitely be your work still stays your work. So if you wanna, uh, if you publish something, you know nobody else gets to to edit it for you. Uh, so in that sense, it's different. But there is this uh, this point where people can you know build on it. So for example, if you share a manuscript and people feel like they want to review it. They can, you know, download it, uh, create some edits, and send it back to you if you want. M might not be the most uh, welcome, uh, depending on what stage you're at, but uh, <laughs> it might also be incredibly helpful in other situations. So really to say, well, everything you see, you can build on um, without any issue. And I think especially with respect to, for example, my background is in uh, social psychology also, um, before I turned to statistics, and there, one of the big issues is really that quite a lot of these, um, these psychological scales end up being copyrighted. And it even happened just a few months ago that a paper got retracted because they used a copyrighted scale without the permission. And you wonder, well, if it's published in a research paper, then you should feel confident to be able to build new research on it and not have stuff like this happen. All right. Um... So here's a, an anonymous question from the audience. Uh, can you describe or perhaps even show visually if you have some backup slides there, um, what your vision would look like for researchers and, and what would be the things that researchers rely on in terms of quality control? I mean, would all modules be peer reviewed uh, or only some? So a little more detail there. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, uh, uh, let me just get some, some slides over here. Um, the, the idea here really being that um, what we now do with publishing is that we do not embed the chrono chronological order of how we, uh, how we actually do the work. So in essence, we have to trust the story uh, in, in the order it's told. So we know that pre-registrations have become a thing where we try to really figure out, well, did the predictions actually happen before people had the data. And one of the things that, um, that I can show you a bit more visually is also this question of, well, when we speak about questionable research practices, we often talk about here on the left that we have the sort of the empirical cycle in the standard situation, but people take a shortcut. So they go from the results back to the prediction and you know, go through the process again. But in essence, on the right, if we would see this as um, publishing each step, each module, um, as we go along, it's, it's no longer an issue. It's no longer a shortcut. It's part of the process as it develops. So we see, for example, here the, these predictions at the bottom with the, with the sort of like colored arrow here, they're a step in how the research develops over time. So here it, you can trace back exactly where the, where, the, um, where the order of events came from, but on the left, if we would encapsulate this in a paper, we would end up seeing the story that's, that we're being shared and we just have to trust it at its face value. Um, so really this idea of we see the research develop as it goes along, so we get this continuous way of 
staying up to date also with what other people are working on, but also knowing that the order of events is actually the chronological order that, um, that they're being presented in. So it gives us a way to also, I don't like the word audit because that goes towards a, too much of a con control culture, but uh, uh, yeah, I would use the word provenance there. Yeah, good, good. Um, so, it, so here's sort of, yeah, maybe this is too specific, but I'm wondering, is, is the idea that everything here is sort of time-stamped and sort of interrelations between specific bits and parts are continually sort of tracked and made visible? And, and I mean, the sort of, I mean, in a way, this can sound kind of creepy, right, in terms of privacy, if, you know, what people do as researchers is sort of continually traced and tracked and sort of made publicly available in these modules, would people really be happy about that? Or do you think sort of the radical transparency you, you're envisioning here is a good thing? People yeah, I, I, fully, I, I fully agree. So, so in my private life, I'm super, super vigilant about, uh, about the data that I sort of leak online and I do these cleansing exercises. Right. Uh, oh, maybe you so, want to stop screen sharing again so people can see oh, you yeah. a bit bigger. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, makes sense. Um, so in that sense, I fully understand that concern. And for me, that's also, again, where the autonomy comes in. Uh, so what we really say is it's all about when the researcher is ready to share something. That's only when stuff becomes public and in no other situation. Um, so in that sense, it's, um, it's similar to publishing a paper in that sense. Like the dates of when something goes public, those are, uh, those are there. But we're not going to be implementing oh, somebody, you know, clicked on this cell in data, like uh, cell C3 in data set was selected by, by Chris at 10.54 p.m. Um, and that's outside of work, allowed work hours. So now we're going to, you know, report this. Um, to your HR <laughs> exactly. So we, we're on to you, Chris. <laughs> yeah, so, so, so that's definitely something where... I would argue, um, like we see a lot of the data brokerage and uh, uh, surveillance capitalism coming up uh, in platforms like Twitter and Facebook, but also outside of it, that the data is really becoming the business model. And we also see some publishers at least buying platforms that could facilitate this. Uh, I don't exactly know how, that, uh, how their business models look, but I know that, for example, a company like ResearchGate, that they really drive on advertising sales, just like Facebook does. So they, they are gathering data to inform that um, those decisions and those uh, those products that they're offering, really. So one of the core principles for what we're building is also that we say we always respect the privacy of the user. And like if you put in your browser, do not track, 100% guaranteed that we also respect that. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that ultimately, I think this is also one of the things we build everything open source and we try to be uh, really transparent about the decisions that we make because I think this trust shouldn't be given easily, and we've done that too much in the past uh, past decade. Um, so that trust should be should be built. Yeah, yeah, sounds good. Uh, so a question from the audience, Alison Harbin. Uh, I'd like to ask you, so you, Chris, about the reality that, as you once told me, there is a lot of ideological consensus for change, but very little follow through. Uh, since many of us here are dedicated researchers, what's one small shift we can make with our approach that might begin to pave the way to a better future? Yeah, so one of the things that people often told me, um, which uh, for me always was a flag, is uh, pick your battles. And so <laughs> whenever you hear that, you're going in the right direction, uh, is my personal perspective. And um, I think that often, from, from my personal experience, was really that there's often this false choice issue where it feels as if, should I do X, should I push back against something? Um, whereas, in essence, for me, it often boiled down to the realization of, well, that there isn't really a choice. Uh, it's either the, the question of giving in or at least voicing concerns. And I think that that is really already uh, worth a lot, like voicing what's going on inside um, your lived experience so that other people can 
you know, learn and build on that as well. Because ultimately, I think that if we would talk a lot about a lot of these things, we would also figure out where the issues are. If I talk to people, you know, um, I think the pandemic has done one good thing. It's shown me who, who can and who cannot respect emotional boundaries because we, it forced at least me to talk about these things. And then it also showed, uh, showed face. So I, I definitely recommend to, to how difficult it also may be to voice these things and see what the response is because that's incredibly helpful. And I think that's already very courageous. All right, thanks. A uh, question from Nuria Benitez. Um, even under this module system that you're describing, how can we as the research community prevent the big editors, journals, publishers, publishing houses, or similar sort of organizations to get control of research results dissemination? How can we avoid the uh, concentration of power in those you know, big corporate entities? Yeah, that's a very fair point. Um, I think that um, the research from people like Vincent Naivia have clearly showed how bad it's gotten that I think in the social sciences it's even 70% by the f uh, five big publishers is uh, like 70% of the journals uh, are owned by them. Um, so how do we prevent this? I think that uh, despite any, any you know, criticisms I might have at moments that the open science framework has done a tremendous job, for example, with their, uh, with their preprint servers and just the general uh, source code of what they're building. So that you know, if, if somebody comes along and they wanna build a, another version, they can actually do it. So I think this is one of the reasons uh, also why we build open source. We really wanna encourage people to replicate what we're doing and not create this lock-in. Um, and I think the idea of preprint servers in that sense have also really shown the value of having this idea that's readily implementable. Um, so that you can easily duplicate it, that it's very low cost to duplicate it, so that it's also um, at lower risk of being centralized as badly. Of course, it may still happen, um, but uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a concern. And I think one of the things that for us uh, as an organization that we also do is, you know, we, we hear weekly um, company X buys company Y a, a acquisition for so, so much uh, money. And I think one of the things is also really making very public, not just commitments and promises, but uh, even contractual uh, obligations to say, you know, we will not be uh, acquired by a third party. And um, this is where a big part comes in with respect to, you know, we have issues in society, not just issues in research. And one of those things is how companies are owned. And um, what for us specifically also is, is a, um, a commitment to our supporting members who we have contracts with at a, on an individual level as we say the company will always be owned by the people who work at the company. So no third parties uh, are going to get, uh, uh, can buy us out. And if so, the community will get a, a ton of money. So also <laughs> financial risk for, uh, for, yeah. for them. I mean. So, yeah, I mean, I guess we're not just reimagining academia, we're re reimagining capitalism here, as it were. Exactly. Um, so here's a, a question of a slightly more personal bent. Um, so someone anonymous says, I really like your approach towards research integrity. I also no longer work in academia, which makes me interested in why you chose to pursue your interest outside of academia. Mm. Can you share a little bit more about your journey here, if, if you want to, of course, here in this, in, on this platform? And yeah. sort of follow up, how can you still focus on research integrity while you no longer work in academia? Yeah, more than happy to, to share uh, about that. I've been very public about it as well. I think that for me, one of the things also, um, like I'm happy to share a link to uh, the intro I did for my PhD defense where I sort of explained this a bit. But for me, really, it felt as if, um, as if the changes that I was trying to achieve for myself, at least, that the issue here was that um, the... In academia, it's, it's often, it, academia itself is an established interest in society. So in that sense, it's relatively difficult within academia to change that institution. And I've tried the reform route for quite a long time. Uh, like I think that was six to seven years I tried that. And it wasn't really effective and I got a lot of pushback. And 
maybe you wouldn't call it questionable research practices, but uh, questionable academic practices definitely, uh, definitely came up. Um, so in that sense, uh, that's, that radicalized me in, in, a, in, a, in a way. And then um, let me see, how do I stay in touch with the research integrity field? I must admit it's much harder to do actual research nowadays because I'm also running a business. Uh, so that's definitely something that, um, that's difficult, but I must admit that uh, the, the connections uh, also with some of the people like Lex or uh, Tamarindo or Yuri, uh, they, during my PhD, they, they were such strong connections that they've been uh, upheld after even. So I think that uh, even leaving academia means it's rather difficult to completely disassociate from, uh, from, from the professional network, at least it, it's for me, which I also don't mind. Like, they're nice people. So. You can take the researcher out of academia, but... Um... I mean, you know that saying where <laughs> that you can't take academia out of the researcher. Um, anyway, so thanks a bunch for this, Chris. Um, so it looks like we've sort of run out of questions now, but actually, I want because we have a little extra time now, I want to use that time for something else, which is to thank our sponsors and a few people. So I'm going to do that now, but not, of course, before we thank you for sharing your vision, some of your journey, and sort of inspiring us on this Friday afternoon. Thanks for being with us, uh, Chris, and I hope you'll stick around for the panel afterwards, too. All right, thanks. Um, so I quickly want to acknowledge the organizations and individuals who made this event possible. So they are, uh, first of all, the Templeton World Charity Foundation, uh, who is a sponsor of our project, Epistemic Progress in the University, um, and this seminar is one of the things we organize. In addition, there is the Netherlands Research Integrity Network, which is sponsored by the Dutch Association of Universities. So they've also made this event possible. And of course, there are the um, universities involved where most or many of us involved in this project work. So the Vrije Universiteit Amsterdam and the Amsterdam University Medical Centers. Um, and I'd also like to thank three people in particular who have been sort of running around behind this stage here. And actually, if you want to come down here and be on the stage in the spotlight for you know a very brief amount of time. So Doreen, Iris, and Samira, are you around? Because it is sort of embarrassing that I and Yuri and Lex have been standing here in the spotlight these three days, whereas the people I'm about to introduce to you actually made this, uh, this event happen. And I didn't actually tell them about this, so they might not particularly enjoy being called into the spotlights now, but I'm doing it anyway, because I do want to thank you uh, for all your fantastic work. I mean, many of you have been in touch with, through email with Samira over there, Iris, she's been our online moderator today and yesterday, I think, and here's Doreen. So why don't you close your, your eyes and then imagine a roaring applause and we'll, you know, we'll do our best. <laughs> This is fantastic work, uh, all of you, and we're really thankful that you have made this event possible. Thanks for putting in all that effort. And thank you, Jeroen, for being the moderator today, well, of course. I mean, <laughs> happy to, to, to have done so. Um, thanks so much. Um, I think all our panelists are already here. Uh, I see a number of them up on our screen there. Good, good. So, uh, Joris and uh, Caccioni, why don't you join us here? And thank you again. Um, we'll see you around. <clears throat> um, so now we'll start the final bit of our summer seminar, final bit of today and the entire summer seminar. Uh, so a panel discussion on the role of journals, publishers, um, and other research integrity stakeholders. We have a couple of quick polls for you. If you can pull them up, and we'll start with one of those. Um, let's see if that works. You should get a cue as to where the poll is, menti.com, use 67340487. So that's 67340487. Um, and maybe we can get a visual, yeah. So the first question, uh, who bears primary responsibility for securing that research is carried out with integrity? So whose responsibility is that primarily? Let's get some of your opinions on that.
So that's interesting. It's, I mean, so far we have you know, a fair amount of agreement that it's really the individual researchers and teams of researchers. Um, nobody so far has said the science funders or the publishers bear the primary responsibility. And I mean, maybe that is sort of the natural thing to say because we're asking for the primary responsibility. Um, but you know, let's ask our, 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 you know, the representatives of our publishers here. What do you? I mean, would you agree that it's really the primary responsibilities of researchers, universities, but not necessarily the publishers? Yeah, I, I, I think you said it right. The, the key word here is uh, the uh, primary responsibility. I think uh, I would really be interested. I don't think we can change the poll now, but uh, who, who should be who should support or who is more, most? Mm. Uh, able to support or secure uh, integrity. I think that's an entirely different question, but I, I agree. It's in the end, it's the, the researcher that, that bears responsibility. Yeah. Would you agree or? I think it's a really interesting question in the sense of, if I, if I think about one piece of research and one research project, I would say I agree, but it, the individuals only exist within an ecosystem and you know, who's, who's got the power in the ecosystem or who's, who's providing the incentives in the ecosystem, right? Um, and I think the publishers and the funders and the institutes have this huge influence, we can't deny it, right? Um, and we have to be really careful, it's, being, it's driving the right behaviors. Um, and we hear more and more how competitive it is to get funding, for example, you know, how competitive it is to get published. You can't deny that, that that's probably gonna influence people's behaviors. And I, I tend to think, you know, when people blame the system, I think, well, the system's the same for everyone. Most people are behaving honestly, even if they think the system is unfair, right? Yeah. And only a few people behave dishonestly. But if, if I think the more people feel the system isn't fair, the more they, they may allow themselves to go, well, if the system isn't fair, why should I behave fairly, yeah, right, of or course. honestly? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it, so it's, it's intrinsically connected to each other, but um, yeah, interesting yeah. one. So th <laughs> this is good, actually, I mean, I think what, this, what, what you're saying brings out that this question might actually have a false presupposition, which is that we have to choose between these four options. Uh, and I guess what you're saying, well, the responsibility is sort of this complex shared collective thing. So to our online panelists, is there anyone who disagrees with what's been said so far or, or someone who would like to add anything? Uh, if I can just sure. say, I, yeah, I, I think that uh, it is a shared responsibility. It's not just one rotten apple, but it, that apple is in a box or a, a basket of apples. And the, both the researchers and their institutions should be primarily responsible for um, responsible conduct of research because one individual, it's a community science is a, is a collaborative um, work in science and we cannot be isolated. Thanks, Anna. Anyone else? Um, so, Chris, yeah, go ahead. I, uh, I, I was just thinking about this because like, um, it's not fully my honest standpoint, but I think that one of my experiences with like uh, institutional review boards, uh, ethics review boards, uh, also having been a reviewer, is that with putting more and more burden on the uh, institute to feel responsible for the ethics of everything that comes out of it uh, might also increase this sort of audit culture idea. So I'm, w w as a researcher myself, I would argue that I'm ultimately responsible for you know the stuff I do out in my studies. But I do agree that universities um, uh, have a certain shared burden. But I definitely wouldn't want to put too much pressure on them. Yeah. Good. Good. Um, all right, so why don't we take the next poll question. Which changes in publishing practices would be most conducive to research integrity? So we have a number of options there, and let's see what you think. Open access publishing, post-publication peer review, requiring open data for publication, or requiring pre-registration. I mean, these options don't necessarily exhaust everything that we can do, but they are proposals that have been on our agenda and on the table in today's discussions and yesterday's and the day before. That's interesting. We see a little bit of a preference for uh, open data as a requirement for publication. Also pre-registration. Uh, well, let's, let's ask our online panelists. What would you, I mean, maybe you've already put in your answer, but what, which one would you choose? 
Um, Sergio, what do you think? Um, well, let me start by saying that I'm a little surprised about the uh, the answer of the of the audience, uh, saying that open data uh, would be one of the the most uh, important elements for a, a conducive environment of uh, research integrity. Um, it also doesn't really align with the poll that we had uh, earlier today during my own uh, contribution when I asked uh, people if you're a reviewer or in, if you imagine yourself as a reviewer, um, do you actually check the data underlying a study for, uh, for indications of misconduct or questionable research practices? And I think in general, um, this is a problem that we already have so many things to do and so many things to, to care about that just adding this additional task of also needing to go through all this data when you do a, uh, a review or just when you're reading an article, uh, I think not too many people actually do that. So while in theory, uh, uh, adding a lot of data and supplementary material, etc., to all your articles, that would, of course, uh, allow dedicated people to go in and to actually check what's uh, uh, what's potentially wrong. Uh, but I, well, I'm afraid that the vast majority of people just does not have the time or, or willingness or capacity even to do so. Yeah, I think that's, I mean, that's a very sobering remark, but I think you're absolutely right that this is a practical difficulty. Um, so I wonder about our other panelists. Um, Josh, do you have any thoughts on this as a philosopher? Because some of these practices might be a little alien to, to us as philosophers, but I wonder what you think. Yeah, so I think <laughs> I, I um, plumped for the... Um, post-publication peer review and I guess I was like remembering something that Joris was saying earlier which is that um, the idea that there's already so much post-publication peer review that kind of happens and is like a really important part of like maybe the kind of grey literature and stuff that happens within science that doesn't get super well documented and um, just the thought that I mean uh, certainly in philosophy but in a bunch of other disciplines as well and I think it's really important here to remember that uh, yeah, academic research is really heterogeneous. Um, that seems like it's something that was helpful in lots of situations. It's a kind of like um, uh, a general purpose, like structural change within academic research. Whereas I was, yeah, I guess this is what Yoram was asking about. Like some of the other changes feel like they work would work really well for like data um, heavy kinds of research, but maybe not for research in the humanities or um, certain bits of like social science as well. Yeah, yeah, good. Anna, you had your hand up before. Yes, I do. And I would, um, I have a completely different opinion. I think that pre-registration of studies is very important, uh, first of all, because uh, it uh, allows uh, the assessment of the validity of the study, because you see what they wanted to do, and then you can check what they actually submitted. Uh, and secondly, it reduces waste in research, because in many uh, fields, you know, especially in medicine, why we should spend uh, resources and uh, uh, expose participants to unneeded harm if we have learned already something and we have strong evidence. So why would we repeat studies? So if I see that a study has been done, then that means, you know, I, I should ask, uh, ask a new uh, hypothesis. I'm not a philosopher, but, you know, for a, I think for a philosophical, philosophical point of view, pre-registration of studies or even hypotheses would be a good thing because you're kind of starting from that hypothesis. You can then refute it, uh, confirm it, and so on. So I think we have to start with a start, and that is the idea. And opening ideas uh, would uh, contribute to... Um, more responsible uh, and good research. Yeah, yeah, good. So, Chris, was that just a thumbs up, or did you want to add anything? I'm always very uh, happy to use the reactions in the in the Zoom. So, yes, uh, that was just a thumbs up. All right, excellent. Um, any thoughts from our publishing representatives, perhaps? Well, actually, I tend to agree with uh, open data, but also here it depends who you ask. Um, indeed, in medicine, pre-registration. Uh, might be more effective, but I think overall, indeed, having the 
uh, data available, and not just to reviewers, because I agree with Sergey, you don't have to, you don't want to bother the reviewers too much because they have a, a lot to do. Uh, but again, we are developing tools that can help them, and review might also take place on the level of repository, for example. Um, machines can help, and also post-publication. If somebody really wants to replicate the research, having the data is essential. Um, so, yeah, I, I tend to uh, agree with the, uh, the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. All right, good. Um, so why don't we take our next poll question? All right, queuing it in now. All right, what's the most important role for scientific publishers in relation to research integrity? So a number of options there. Quality control, providing access to data and finding findings, uh, distributing and promoting important work. And there's the option of something else, which is sort of, I mean, I guess it's going to be sort of mysterious what people think there, because we cannot actually <laughs> ask the audience that's inputting these answers. But maybe some of you will have thoughts. Um, so maybe I feel we should start with the publishers themselves. And of course, you've already said a lot about these issues. But um, if, it's, if you had to choose, I mean, which option would you go for, uh, Catriona? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The, the quality control, um, of course. Um, um, bearing in mind, of course, that um, the process, the paper is going through with the editors, with the reviewers, um, there's still a limit to it, right? So people tend to complain about how long it takes to get published, right? How long the process takes. So you're always looking at the balance between, you know, how many reviewers are you going to have? Are you going to have statistics, re statistics reviewers? Are you going to have additional revision rounds? You know, how many times are you going to send the authors back to do more experiments or not, right? So you're always trying to have that balance between um, how, much, how much you want to improve the paper, um, or, for example, you know, check for, for, for serious ethical issues versus, you know, how, how much the author is expected to, to do on top of their previous version. Um, but I would say, um, like, Chris's vision and also, you know, similar to, like, very established preprint servers like the Archive, right, which are really established in that community, um, that performs a really important function. Um, and the, the, the difference between that and a journal is effectively the quality and integrity control. That's more or less the difference, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, and both things can coexist in both. And we saw with COVID, right, how important the function of preprint servers was particularly. Maybe for that community, it was an awakening, right? Whereas in physics, this has been normal for like 20 years already. Um, so if you have to say the unique, the unique thing that journals bring um, is the quality control um, um, insofar as yeah. It can be possible. Yeah. I think the research data goes along with it, but it's a, it's a good point. Realistically, we have data journals that are doing, are doing really well in terms of the, there's really good um, reception where actually then the data is being reviewed. But then you can also look at traditional journals where the data is probably realistically, the raw data is probably maybe not going to be peer reviewed, but it's there and at least it's available. So if, if post-publication people want to review it, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and if, so I'm going to be a bit, a little bit cheeky now. If we can ask for your honest opinion on whether sort of reality is in alignment with what the ideal would be for quality control, uh, what would your honest opinion be? And we can go off the record. We can edit this out if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> Yours is any thoughts? Yeah, m maybe just one remark. Okay, before. sure. I, I, I think the, the role of publishers changed. Um, um, Again, going back to the essence of publishing, making public, uh, 300 years ago, our raison d'être was the printing press, right? That was the only thing we did, basically. Right. And now, uh, information is ubiquitous, and it's our task to really make sure that the right content in the right format comes to the right community. So that's a, that's a pretty big, big shift. Um, but, but very important, I think, in the current landscape of just information you can find everywhere. Um, well, I think, again, it, it, I think it's managing expectations and what is, how does the scientific process work and uh, uh, how does it work and what is our role in there? And again, let's move away from the idea that whatever comes out of the publication process is the truth with a big or even a small t. Mm. It is just the best we can do to make sure it, it ends up in the right community so it can be taken further there. And in, can we do better? Yeah, I'm sure we can. You can always do better, but um, uh, I think... Um, uh, I think we bring a lot of expertise and also increasingly technology to make sure that's done optimally. All right. All right. I'll, I'll take that as an answer. But <laughs> always open for suggestions. Of <laughs> to make it better. Good. I, I think good. something that's maybe good to mention is uh, ties in with post-publication peer review, right? And it's um, 
it's a sort of a dream that many have held for a long time. I know, I think also when PLUS first launched, their plan was that eventually to move it all towards post-publication peer review, right? And there's many benefits to that, of course, in terms of speed and transparency. Um, Unfortunately, what we see in journals, which I'm sure would be the same thing, you know, if you would try to overlay, you know, peer review on top of a preprint server, is that it's really hard to get people to review papers. And it's even harder to get the qualified people to review papers. And it takes a lot of chasing and, network, honestly, networking. You know, a lot of peer review is because of networks, because people knowing the editor and knowing the board member. And finding the right reviewer is like one of the most crucial steps, you know, towards quality control. And we've all seen it, right? And we've seen it with attractions where we've papers where we go, yeah, this should have really been reviewed by somebody with data science expertise, for example, which it wasn't, you know, things like that. Um, so that thing of finding the right person, getting the right person to actually say yes, and getting the right person to review the paper in a reasonable time frame, that actually takes tremendous effort. And at the, by now, because of the scale, it also takes a lot of technology to sort of even manage it because it's so big. Um, so having it post, you know, posting it first, like for example, as Faculty 1000 do, you know, post it and then do the peer review after. Yeah, I, I think that's a great, a great um, concept. But in the end, Getting the right person to do the review is the same challenge, whether you do it pre or post. And I'm open to both. I think there's a lot of benefits to doing it post. Mm. But in the end, it's still the same challenge. It still needs to be managed. And it doesn't happen by magic. And I sure. think that's the challenge with post-publication peer review. You know, it's um, um, if a lot of content will just not be reviewed at all. If there isn't someone driving it and managing it, it just won't happen. Yeah. Fair. Yeah, okay, so that's the publishers. Let's hear from the users and consumers of the journal. So Anna, please go ahead. Yes, thanks. Uh, I'm editor of a journal and uh, although I like data and I work with data, you know, what is journal for? Journal is not only for quality control. Journal is there to tell a story because, you know, I will again refer to uh, philosophy of science and uh, Karl Popper who said that uh, scientific discovery is akin to storytelling. So journals are telling a story and people want to read a story just like Chris told us a story. <laughs> Uh, of future and this is what journals are for to kind of sift through data and to uh, uh, tell a story about scientific discovery and that will not be replaced just by huge amount of data that is available there there will still be someone who needs to tell a story to yeah. different audiences. good good so i guess this goes under the something else label on our axis there no, yeah. it's, uh, the, the presenting new things and uh, presenting uh, novel research all yeah. the other things yeah good good uh, josh yeah thanks i guess this is just picking up on um anna's comment i guess there's there's kind of two ways of i've been kind of puzzling about this over the last day like there's kind of two ways of thinking about the roles of um journals and publishers right like so you can think like well, journals and publishers um, come in at the level of the individual paper, and it's about making like individual contributions to scientific inquiry like better. So it's more at the level of like quite granular little, little bits of science. And then there's another picture where it's like, well, it's about the kind of um, social structure of science, like picking up uh, ideas, like um, cultivating certain kinds of communication structures and making sure like um, the right kinds of things are getting, um, uh useful kinds of things are getting communicated to a bunch of people and that's not really about like trying to change what's in individual papers it's more about like the communication structure of science at like a collective level so i kind of wonder if there's like a yeah i was on i was answering this more about communicating things and about like quality control but i wonder if there's like a kind of level split then there's like um two different levels of which journals and publishers uh have roles to play and I guess yes. Anna was picking up on like more of the like, it's about the collective love, it's about telling a story rather than like, it's about like <laughs> getting each paper as good as you can. Yeah, good. Chris? So what I, uh, I, I don't know if I'm allowed to answer the mentees, but I was. So I was one of the something else. And, uh, and you are allowed. The, it's fine. <laughs> okay, good. Um, because I always have to think of this, uh, this model from the library and information sciences where they say there's five key functions for any scholarly communication system. And that was why I said something else because quality control or certification is definitely one. Another is registration, um, which you could argue we do for a select amount, but as these registries show, we definitely don't register all the findings. And then the other is accessibility, 
archival and um, incentives to do uh, research. So like the currency that was spoken about the other day as well. And I think those five functions, for me at least, always provide a very good framework to think about the, 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 the important things that need to happen. So with respect to integrity, I'm, I'm not sure that's why something else, but I thought I'd mention those. Yeah, good, good, good. Sergio, do you want to add? And just adding on what Chris just said, and what I think is a bit missing from this discussion so far is that for me, journals also have a, and it ties into what George said, uh, a very prominent function in community building. Because um, especially the more um, traditional disciplinary focused uh, journals, um, I think they, they play a huge role in, in distinguishing and establishing, maintaining a, a scientific community and also setting the standards, among others relating to research integrity, uh, that this community collectively uh, wants or tries to adhere to. And so by setting these standards about what it really means to do good research or what you should or shouldn't publish, uh, how you should publish this, how and what kind of stories uh, we are uh, allowed to tell and which of those are interesting to share uh, with the world. Uh, I think that's a very important function of journals and a way in which they can steer uh, debates also uh, along the lines of research integrity. Yeah, just to, uh, I find that really interesting, the idea of a community, you see it particularly with new research areas. Um, I sometimes think of peer review or like a journal peer review as the original social network, you know, the most productive social network ever before there was even, you know, the internet when we were literally posting papers around to reviewers all around the world, you know, um, and that ties in really closely, the community and the reviewers and the editors and the relationships with each other, it all sort of ties in, in terms of like, sometimes you find we have a journal, we see a lot of a new area field coming up and we see yeah this is a distinct community does this make sense to launch a new journal because it's you know for example 20 years ago it would have been biomaterials or something like that um, and having that vision uh, very often also coming from an editor or someone approaching us and saying I see this new community emerging and then the community sort of builds around the journal you know um, and it will be interesting to see you know when uh, as now we have more sort of a broader scope journals, you know, that are less niche. Um, how does that work? You know, do you, you know, how does the community then then fit with that? Um, but yeah, it's a really, I really like that point. Yeah, uh, Chris, is that your hand from before, or do you have a new comment? No, I had a very, very brief comment. Sure. Is that there's a fascinating um, paper also about uh, Sergei calls it community, but where they use economic theory, where they say uh, that journals are club goods. So just like your country club sort of can be status, uh, that also journals are, operate like that. And community has a very positive connotation and club may be less so, so I thought I'd throw it in. Depends on the kind of club, I feel like. <laughs> but yeah, that's good. Yep. It's a risk. Um, so I feel like we should move to the fourth and final poll question now. <clears throat> um, which research assessment and evaluation practices would be better abandoned to promote research integrity? And this, I mean, this is a topic that would have been addressed originally in Sara Dereika's contribution, but, and it's something that we haven't really talked a lot about, but it is something that is part of the whole research integrity discussion. So to round things off, we'll just start talking about a new topic now. <laughs> so bean counting, quantitative measures of publications, citations, and so on and so forth. Um, ranking of departments and or universities, maybe even individual researchers, um, periodic research assessments of departments and groups, or again, the option of something else. Um, can I ask one of the online panelists to uh, share their opinion first? Anyone who wants to volunteer? Strong feelings about evaluation or I assessment practices? Uh, and I hear, um, I would just say other because I think a combination should be uh, uh, the answer because you cannot have just one way of looking at uh, uh, excellence. And I particularly talk about uh, a country with, uh, uh, with that is small scientifically. We are scientifically inbred uh, country, which is defined by the number of, of uh, 
uh, doctoral fellows could stay at the same university, which means you know that we are closed in itself and don't need to publish. You can publish in your country's journals for um, uh, academic advancement. So in that situation, every every system can be perverted and corrupted and used to promote your friends and not real excellent science. So we definitely need some bean counting to set a level that this is the standard below threshold below which we cannot do. But then again, that, that uh, is very dangerous for kind of killing uh, the, the uh, spikes or, or excellence uh, in the community. So I think it should be both. It's very difficult to find a single way of measuring uh, scientific uh, success or excellence. Yeah, good. Uh, Joris? Yeah, I think, <clears throat> uh, again, I tend to agree with the, uh, with the audience. I, I think this is maybe so indeed something that we, are, uh, we didn't discuss. Uh, the problems indeed arise with quantifying results and um, as has been um, researched and, and, uh, and described it has to do with of course the enormous growth of science when it evolved from an amateur activity or a small uh, activity uh, to a large scale professional um, um, basically large system and institution and the problems we have indeed is how then you how do you rate or how do you quantify or how do you qualify research if you if, if the, the human connection is gone if it's so big that you need some kind of um, a metric to measure it so and I agree with Anna whatever metric you come up with it will always lead to distortion and misuse etc but um, you have to you have to to quantify it in some way um, but maybe indeed we can be a bit more creative with not just only the number of publications and citations. It's very difficult, but I think indeed that is one of the uh, one of the things to prevent uh, issues around research integrity. Uh, for example, with data, research data sharing, very important. We should also make sure that researchers are promoted and are rewarded for sharing data. For example, also citing or counting how much data is shared and cited, etc. So it's something I think that needs our continuous attention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Any of the online panelists? Um, Chris, Josh, Sergio, maybe? This is a tough question. I, I do realize that. Um, so just as a, as a brief thought on this, uh, I think any of the, uh, or most at least, of the, the things we discussed so far go about or are about uh, impact measurements and then quantitative uh, stuff. and. I think indeed many of these have caused problems, but they're not inherently uh, or fundamentally uh, the cause of any of these problems. Uh, I think a much more fundamental shift can take place when we do not longer assess only individual outputs, um, but rather processes um, or practices of scientists. Uh, and in the same way, not uh, assess only individuals, but, but teams or collectives uh, of science in a much more uh, holistic way uh, in that sense. And that can be either quantitatively or quantitatively. And but I think well, we need changes in that respect on a much, much more fundamental level, uh, rather than just about discussing which kind of indicators will be good or bad or desirable or undesirable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris, I, you're sort of nodding there, I think. Uh, does this fit with your vision for the future of science? Yeah, so, so for me, one of the things uh, is indeed also about it's intellectually very easy to just be like, this is a metric, let's use it, and always what I found very interesting is this question of what can we use to replace it? And I think it's a very genuine question and it's, it's a difficult question. And I've come to think about it, well, how would we approach, you know, uh, the thing, how do we even formulate what it is that we're trying to evaluate? So with, for example, the uh, Dutch Research Council, the, the, the Vichy Fund, it's, I sort of implicitly, I'm not 100% sure, they often want people who have very densely interconnected research lines and build on that. Well, that's a research question that you could technically operationalize and see how, how can we actually measure it so that we have a sort of like a research-driven process for the things that we try to evaluate so that the metrics that, that we use 
are sort of custom for a specific scenario, which I guess will be costly. And a, a lot of this is about efficiency and how do we create uh, low cost ways to you know rank and, and et cetera. But for me, uh, a research-based approach would be uh, a very interesting way to approach some of these questions of how do we evaluate and it would really force us to articulate what it is that we're interested in. Yeah, good. So people, I'm going to say it's a wrap. Um, it's been a long day. In fact, it's been three long days. Uh, so we've all deserved our weekend by now. So let's thank our speakers and panelists again. Thanks for a very lively and wonderful discussion. Um, I mean, I know that my head is sort of brimming with ideas and perspectives and insights on research integrity, and you are all responsible for that. So wonderful, lovely. Thank you also to our audience for being with us today or all three days. Um, this has been a wonderful event and we do hope to see you again, hopefully physically here in Amsterdam, but if not that, then certainly at our next online event. Thanks for being with us and enjoy your weekends.